The Price of Fear. Brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello there. Are you a Who Done It fan? I mean the good old-fashioned kind, with a closed circle of cut-and-dried suspects exuding cut-and-dried clues until the last chapter when all is revealed and you kick yourself for not having been able to work it all out without the author's help. <laughs> Who Done It's are out of fashion now, I'm told, perhaps because truth is never as cozy or as well-ordered as fiction. I was once in a position where I found I had been in possession of certain facts, the significance of which had for years eluded me. This was just as well because I was spared the final and horrifying knowledge, which was itself a killer. For at first, you see, I wasn't even aware that there had been a crime. Let me explain. Oh, by the way, I, I think I'll call this story Guy Fox Night. It was all brought back to me last November when I was in London by one of those impossible coincidences that sometimes happen. Papers? Evening papers? Get your papers here. Penny for the guy, mister. I had strolled out in the early evening to get some air and to buy a paper. Please, Gub, spare a penny for the old guy. When I was accosted by this little fellow, one of a band of sturdy urchins who proliferate in the London streets in the weeks immediately preceding November 5th, only the English would make an annual festival out of an attempted massacre of their temporal rulers. Perhaps it comes from a misplaced assumption of invincibility. But for me, its horrific associations are rather more immediate. I gave the boy a small donation. Oh, thanks, mister. And bought a paper. Three pence. Thank you, sir. I glanced at it casually, meaning to read it at my leisure later. But my eye was caught by a headline. Sir David Thomas found dead. Sir David Thomas, 37, a distinguished psychiatrist and specialist in nervous diseases, was found dead in his Harley Street consulting rooms early today. He had suffered from earlier heart tremors, and, and the rest of the article consisted of an obit on his fine list of achievements in the field of psychiatric research. I remembered the last time but one that I had seen David Thomas. It was in uh, 1960. There's a Mr. David Thomas to see you, sir. David? Uh, I don't know anyone called David Thomas. Ask him what he wants. Just a moment, sir. I was tired and irritable. My plane to London had been delayed by fog, and I was due on the set at some godforsaken hour the next morning. I just wanted to get to bed. Are you still there, sir? Yes. He says you knew his mother, sir. The lady's name was Helen. Helen? Helen Thomas. Oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, you'd better send him up. Right away, sir. Surprisingly, I recognized my visitor the moment he walked in. I say surprisingly because the last time I had seen David, it was at his home, Rykart. <laughs> He'd been all of fourteen. It was good of you to see me, sir. I'm sorry to barge in like this. Damn cheap without writing and all that. But I don't know who else to turn to. Well, sit down, David. <laughs> Has been a long time. Another world, sir. Rykart Manor. Rykart Manor, yes. How's your mother? It's because of her that I'm here. She's not well, sir. Oh, I am sorry, David, very sorry. You see, she once told me that you and she had been, well, close. Well, that was a long time ago, David. As you say, another world. What's wrong? She hasn't been really well since the night of that Guy Fawkes party at Rycott. Do you remember it? Yes, of course. She had some shock. We never discovered what it was. She wouldn't or couldn't talk about it. Most of the time she's quite rational, but she has violent periods. She has to be protected. You understand me, sir? She lives quietly at Panton Sanatorium. But can't she be cured? The doctors and nurses are very kind, but it seems her mind has gone. Oh, no. Oh. At first I couldn't accept it either. 
Mother had been such a gentle person. I resented a god who could let such things happen. Even her doctors didn't seem able to help her. So I made up my mind to become a doctor and try to beat them at their own game. I take my finals next year. Then I hope to specialize. Well, of course, I wish you all the luck in the world, David. That goes without saying, but I, I really don't see how I can help. Oh, but you can help, sir. You see, Mother won't see me. Oh? She won't even have me in the same room with her. And she won't tell anyone why. Well, I... I... You could see her. You were there that night. Find out what's behind it all. Why she hates me so. Then we can begin to treat her. Well... Oh, please don't say no. She's talked about you to the nurses. I don't think they really believe she knows such a famous man. Please do this for me, sir. I know she'd love to see you. Would Helen really be so pleased to see me after all these years? We'd been art students together at London University way back in 35. She was an attractive, vital girl, and naturally competition to take her out had been keen. Can I have a drink, Vincent? Certainly. I want to talk to you. Well, talk away. Listen, Vincent. I'm going to get married. You did say married? Mm -hmm. I've thought about it, and it seems a good solution. A <laughs> solution to what? You're not serious. Vincent. Well, may I ask the name of the lucky man? Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas? Oh, well, now I know you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding, Vincent. He asked me last night. Well, no. But... Before you say anything else, listen to me. I've got no illusions about my talent. So you're selling out, hmm? Cynically, but accurately put. I've lost interest, I'm afraid. Helen, do you know what sort of a reputation this Frank Thomas has? A lot of nonsense put about by his enemies. Nothing's ever been proved against him, just because he's rich and has got a lovely house in the country. Yes, I've heard about Rycott Manor. <laughs> Helen, you're not marrying a house, you know. Oh, Vincent. After that, my feelings towards Helen took a decidedly chilly turn. And though she asked me, I didn't go to the wedding. Instead, I returned to America and got on with my professional career, which, as it turned out, put her effectively out of my mind. I do appreciate you coming to see Mother, Mr. Price. It's all right, David. It's a pleasure. Oh, I think we've not far to go now. Over the crest of the next hill. It's pretty country, isn't it? Yes, yes, but then I always find the English countryside captivating. The house lies in its own grounds, just like Rycott. Do you remember the old home? My only visit to the Thomases' home was some 15 years or so after that last night out with Helen. I was back in England to discuss a new movie when one day, totally out of the blue... I received a letter asking me to attend a Guy Fawkes firework party at Rycott Manor. At first I couldn't think who I could possibly know at such an exalted address. Then I realized that it must be Helen. Although we had not parted on the best of terms, my curiosity got the better of me. I badly wanted to know how things had worked out for her, so I decided to accept the invitation. I couldn't get away from town until late which meant I arrived at the house after the other guests had finished supper. It was one of those deliciously crisp evenings peculiar to fall in England, so I paid off the taxi at the bottom of the drive and approached Rycott Manor across the lawns, the best way to see it. Fairy lamps had been strung along the trees in front of the terrace, and I could see the great bonfire waiting to be lit. Above it, as if surveying the scene was the guy. It was tied to what appeared to be a plank, its head fastened back so that the straw wouldn't fall out. Silhouetted against the lamps, twinkling in the trees and the lights from the house, it looked uncannily lifelike. I even fancied that its eyes caught the light, reflecting it like those of a, of a cat. It was obviously constructed with the loving care of an artist. Helen met me at the door. Vincent! Vincent, how good to see you. Here, let me take your coat. I want to talk to you alone before we join the others. 
Frank is resting in his study, so I'll take you into the morning room. How like Helen I thought to have a morning room. Well, the world-famous film actor. <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased for you, Vincent. Helen, let me look at you. Hmm? Now, how have you been? I read in the papers that you were here, so I thought for old time's sake... Helen. Yes? How have you been? Do you want a truthful answer or merely a polite one? Is it so bad? If you say I told you so, I'll send you packing at once. But I told you nothing you didn't already know. That makes it worse. Well, go on, tell me. I have everything material that I want. I go short of nothing. But there is no love in this house, Vincent, and it frightens me. Frank is too busy. If he's not running his offices in the city, he's running the estate down here. And he does that just as efficiently and... Just as ruthlessly. Well, why have you stuck it out all these years? Because I have a son, Vincent. You'll be meeting him presently. His name is David, and he's fourteen. He's all I live for now, Vincent. David. Hmm? And um, how does David get on with his father? Truly, I don't know. David is hard to know, like his father. Sometimes I think he hates him. Oh, my poor Helen. Please don't pity me, Vincent. I've been holding on to my self-control for years, and it wouldn't take much to let go. David is a sensitive, intelligent boy, but their interests are totally different. Uh, David takes after you. I fancy he has artistic leanings. Yes, possibly. But why do you say that? Well, my dear, I, I'm deducing that he built that guy I saw as I came oh. here. Hmm? It's a remarkable piece of work, you know. <laughs> There's some... With some haunting quality about it. Thank you. He'll be pleased. He worked hard making it. If your son becomes an artist, you won't have wasted your own talent, you know. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> that was a very nice thing to say. I want to send David away, away to boarding school. I think it's important to get him away from his father's environment. Oh? You see, lately their relationship has deteriorated. Well, what caused that? Anything specific? Well, there was a rather unfortunate incident about two weeks ago. Two poachers were caught on the estate, a crime Frank won't tolerate. They were trapped in a copse, and Frank gave orders to smoke them out. David was there when they were brought out. You see, the men had stuck it out to the last possible moment, and they were so blackened and scorched that their features were unrecognizable. Most of their clothes had gone, and they just lay on the ground and writhed in agony. Two died in hospital. It's touch and go whether the third will recover. But Helen, my dear, that, that's inhuman. Didn't anyone make a complaint? It was hushed up. After all, it wasn't Frank who was breaking the law. He was just protecting his property. Oh, Helen. And then there was the incident of the puppy. What puppy? Well, stupid, really. Father! My God, sir, don't be so namby-pamby. I sometimes wonder what I've spawned, a boy or a girl. I can't see what's wrong in having a puppy. Lots of boys do. What do you call that apology, a puppy? Where are you going to keep it, hmm? In that shoebox? How long do you think it'll fit into that? I don't intend to keep it here. I'm taking it to boarding school with me. That's what the box is for. Oh, bloody well not, you know. What do you think the headmaster's going to say, hmm? Get rid of it before term time. Meanwhile, keep the damn thing out of my sight. You see, Vincent, it was a sad little creature that David had found somewhere. Frank took an instant dislike to it, probably because it was a mongrel and a, a stray, probably the runt of the litter. He never could stand anything that wasn't perfect. Mother, are you in there? Well, come in, darling. Hello, Mother. David, this is... Oh, yes, I, I recognize him. Uh, your picture was in last night's paper, sir. How do you do? I've seen all your films. <laughs> Hello, David. David enjoys the macabre. <laughs> he was a good-looking boy, sturdy and well-built for his age. A good advertisement for a country upbringing. In fact, he was everything his father should have been proud of. I noticed that he was carrying the shoebox. What's your next film going to be about? I don't know, David. As a matter of fact, I don't know what my last one was about. <laughs> How's your puppy? Is it in the box? The box? It's empty. The puppy's dead, sir. Oh, oh David. I am sorry, David. I found David. it this I... evening in one of those awful traps father laid down for the poachers. Oh. It had been struggling for hours because both its hind legs were broken. Oh. 
did. So I had to put it out of its misery. Oh, David. You mean you... you did it yourself? Well, I had to. There was no one else about. Luckily, there was this big, flat stone. Oh, David. It didn't take long. Luckily, Vincent, I've seen those traps. Frank had them put down after catching those poor devils. They're hideous and lethal. I've told him how dangerous they are, but he says it's the only way to stop them. The, the poachers, I I'm mean. I'm not at all familiar with English law, Helen, but surely, well, he could be had up for assault or manslaughter if the worst happened. <gasps> Darling, I'm so sorry about the puppy. It's all right, Mother. Father wouldn't have let me keep it anyhow. I've got over it now. Oh, by the way, I used old Carter's wheelbarrow to carry out the guy. Yes, I saw the guy as I came in. <laughs> it looks splendid. I made it myself. It's wearing one of Father's old suits. Why don't you go out and light the bonfire? Mr. Price and I will join you presently. Take the other guests out onto the veranda, and then ask Carter to light a few of the rockets. We'll keep the set pieces till later. Oh, Mother, I nearly forgot. Father has gone. Gone? In the he had a phone call right after supper. Something urgent at the office. He left a short while ago. Without a word. How like him. Now I'll have to apologize to everyone. I don't think he'll be missed. That will do, David. Now run along. Yes, Mother. See you later, Mr. Price. Yes, David. <laughs> Frank really is the limit. The trouble is he's trying to do too much. Well, I'm sure he thrives on it. No. No, he was taken quite ill at supper. Oh. He's been sleeping badly, too. The doctor gave him some pills, but they don't seem to agree with him. If anything, he's more nervy and erratic than ever. The dislike he took to David's puppy was completely irrational. It's David I'm sorry for, Helen. Yes. Poor David. Oh, look. Look, oh. they're starting the fireworks and lighting the fire. Shall we go out on the terrace? Oh, by the way, w will you be warm enough without a coat? Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, look. They've lit the bonfire. Yes. <laughs> I've always loved this festival. <laughs> there, there it is. It's all on fire now. <laughs> You were right about the guy. Hmm? It does look so real. Hmm. That's strange. What? Do you, do you smell anything odd? No. No, I, I don't think so. I never had a chance to talk to Helen alone again that night. Suddenly I realized that it was much later than I thought, and I would have to dash if I were to catch the last train. For some reason, I had no wish to stay in that house, and Helen was nowhere to be seen. I did see David, though, and felt that if I sent my goodbyes through him, I could drop Helen a line the next day. Well, I, I never did write. An unpardonable lapse of good manners, which to this day I've never been able to explain. David stood watching the bonfire, utterly absorbed in the destruction of his handiwork. The flames licked round the straw-covered hands and the feet of the guy. He appeared to gain great satisfaction when the plank cracked and splintered, and the weird figure it had been supporting slid slowly into the holocaust below. There goes the guy, sir. See how well it burns? I soaked it in paraffin to make sure. Lucky the rain held off tonight, isn't it, sir? You're uh, really enjoying it, aren't you, David? You'll have to make a bigger one next year. Oh, next year. Won't be at all the same, sir. As I waited for the station taxi to arrive, I stood watching the spectacle. Helen had been right. There was an acrid tang in the air, which I put down to the wood smoke, possibly mixed with the approach of a November fog. There is always something splendid and grand about the slow burning of a great fire. I couldn't help comparing it with the fires used for the burning of witches and heretics at the stake, for after all, symbolically, that is what it was. 
The laughing guests standing round watching seemed to, to lose their identity and assume other roles. They became judges, officers of the Inquisition, gleefully satisfied as their tortured victims turned and twisted and shriveled in the purging flames. <laughs> I guess that's what being an actor does for you. The sanatorium. It's just here on the right. Wake up, sir. We're nearly there. Mm. Oh, I, I wasn't asleep, David. What became of your father? My father? Oh, didn't I tell you? No. We never saw him again after that night he left Mother. There were rumours that he had some girlfriend waiting for him in London. Mother had to carry on alone. Weren't inquiries made? Didn't you try to trace him? Trace him? Do you think we wanted him back? I loathed and detested the ground he walked on. So did Mother. His going was the best thing that ever happened to us. He was a brute when he was here, and I hope to God he's dead now. He is, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, we're here. I followed him into the large house. I felt unhappy and apprehensive. I still couldn't decide if I were right to come. My qualms grew as we approached Helen's room. She was sitting on the bed, huddled and emaciated, her hair gray and lank. For a moment I thought there must have been some mistake. This couldn't be Helen. Not the Helen I'd known as a student, nor indeed the hostess of Rycott Manor. Why had it come to this? Vincent? Hello, Helen. Is it really you? It's been so long. Ten years, Helen. You were right, Vincent, weren't you? You told me not to marry Frank. You must forget it and try to get well. I will never get oh, well. Now, Helen, the doctor says you're much better. David is outside. Won't you see your son? I have no son. Tell me what's wrong. Won't you let me help you? You can't help me. No one can. Well, then just see David. No, I'll no, fetch him no, for you. No, I won't see anyone. No. It's no. all right, Mrs. Thomas. Now, calm down. Nobody's forcing you to do anything. Should I leave? Don't... No, no, please don't go. Don't leave me. Just a few moments then, sir. Do you remember that night, Vincent? And that smell, that dreadful smell? Helen, I can't smell anything. <laughs> it's all right, sir. It's one of her fantasies. And the pills. Has anybody looked for the sleeping pill? Helen, Helen, my dear, please be quiet. If I could only find out what's troubling you. Oh, Vincent, I looked for you, but you're gone. Why did you go off and leave me? You never even said goodbye. You never wrote, not a word. Helen, I know, I, I really... It doesn't matter, not anymore. Nothing matters now. I have something to tell you, Vincent. Yes. I'm going to marry Frank Thomas. He's rich and he's got a lovely Stop house. Stop it, Helen. No, no, that's not it. It's something I must remember. I, I must tell you, Vincent. I've got all I want, but there's no love in this house and it frightens oh, me. Oh, my dear, I... I've got a wonderful son, Vincent. His name is David. And he hates his father. Helen. I'm all right, Vincent. Don't pity me, please. Don't pity me. Listen, Vincent. Listen to me. There isn't much time. I'm all right. I must tell you. That night, while it's in my mind, Frank was taken ill after supper. David had been sitting next to his father on his right next to the wine glass. What are you saying, Helen? Don't you understand, Vincent? I can't say any more. Oh, God, what's the use? What's the use? Oh, please, Helen, don't. Please. Please go, Vincent. I'm tired. So tired. David, your mother is obsessed with that night, the night your father walked out on it. There's something I didn't tell you. Oh. I looked up part of our family records. There's insanity there. Mother's illness appears to be hereditary. But does that make it incurable? Not necessarily. This is what I want to research. Nobody really knows how to define hereditary insanity. Perhaps when I'm qualified, I'll be able to help. Two years later, Helen was dead, still without being reconciled to her son. 
The last time I saw David was at her funeral. Of course, I followed his career with interest, knighted at thirty-five and now dead at thirty-seven. Back in my flat, I sat in front of the fire. The flames danced in front of my eyes, and my fireplace assumed the shape of a bonfire. Without any prompting from me, the string of clues that I possessed, as yet unconnected, flashed through my mind. Whether they were clues to what really happened or might have happened, I could not tell. But they didn't make a pretty story. David was there when the poachers were brought out dead. Burnt, blackened and scorched. Both the puppy's hind legs were broken. It had been struggling for hours. And I've seen those traps. They're hideous and lethal. The shoebox, it's empty. 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 It can't be. I can't believe it. Frank was taken ill at supper. David was sitting next to him, next to the wine glass. Nobody looked for the sleeping pills. By the way, I used old Carter's wheelbarrow. I made the guy myself. Self, self, self. Myself. Myself. Self, self, self. That boy? No, it's just not possible. I've got a wonderful son. He hates his father. See how well it burns? I poured some paraffin to make sure. That dreadful smell! Don't you understand, Vincent? Don't you? Don't you? Could it really have happened like that? A boy brooding on his father's cruelty. His hand poised over a wine glass, substituting the original guy stuffing straw into the sleeves and trouser ends. A sturdy and well-built boy who could drag the body of a man into a wheelbarrow, tied to a plank, easy enough. I remembered how uncannily lifelike the guy had seemed, and the roasting of human flesh would have left an acrid, sour smell, wouldn't it? I remembered what. David had said in the car, hadn't he told me himself that his mother's illness was hereditary, and if it was hereditary, why should it stop there? As I picked up the newspaper that had fallen to the floor, the last line of the article caught my eye. Found inexplicably amongst the dead man's papers was an old shoebox, full of some charred and blackened substance, which was later identified as. Human flesh and bone. Guy Fawkes' Night was first recounted and dramatized by Richard Davis, and produced by John Dyers. <laughs>